Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. What's up? Welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got one of the best strength and conditioning coaches of all time, Eric Cressy, on the show. Eric is one of the few people that I really idolized as a young coach. Anything that he had written or put out on video, I just devoured. Eric is a really unique coach in that he's both an elite level power lifter on as you know personally and he's also someone that really understands corrective exercise more than any other strength coach that I know. Usually I think of strength coaches falling into one of two camps. One there's like all of the old school guys that they just want to they almost treat their athletes like bodybuilders or weightlifters and then there are the guys that really gear towards corrective exercises and things like that, which are super valuable. But when that's the sole focus of a strength and conditioning program, they tend to baby their athletes and they just really don't push their athletes. Eric, in my mind, has always been someone that brings together both of those worlds where he's uh, drawing from a ton of different disciplines and he's always just looking for the what is the absolute best that he can give his athletes he's on the very cutting edge of corrective exercises but he's not um he's not using only corrective exercises he's using a variety of different movements and disciplines to get the best out of his athletes so we start the show off actually talking about his struggle in high school with an eating disorder and exercise addiction we talk about how he went from wanting to be an accountant early on in college and how he transitioned into uh, a personal training job that led to a graduate assistant at UConn, which eventually turned into him becoming one of the all-time great strength and conditioning coaches. We talk about how to get buy-in from athletes, whether or not baseball players should be Olympic lifting and lifting overhead. We talk about off-season training as well as how he personally stays focused in a world with so many distractions and opportunities coming his way. Eric works with more Major League Baseball players than any strength and conditioning coach in in history, and there's a reason for that. He gets results, he keeps his athletes injury-free, and he just builds trust with some of the best athletes in the world um, through consistency and through building relationships. This was a real treat for me, and I know you're going to love it. Before we get started, if you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you give me a review on iTunes. And also, I've got a new thing on the website for you if you haven't seen it already. I've got the top five most downloaded podcasts put together in a nice PDF document with the biggest takeaways from each of those podcasts. People are always asking me, what are the most popular podcasts? You know, where should I start? These are the top top five most downloaded and the biggest takeaways from each. You can get that by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash top five. That's brutestrengthtraining.com backslash top five. Enjoy the show. Eric, what's up, man? Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Man, this is such an honor. As I was telling you before the show started, years ago when I became a strength and conditioning coach, you were one of my absolute idols, one of the guys that any anything I could get my hands on that you wrote or recorded on video, I, I just devoured. And I've always loved your kind of holistic approach to strength and conditioning. And it's something that's always really resonated with me. And so today is is really special for me. And thank you for making some time to do this with right. me. I appreciate you saying that, man. It's cool to be on. So always, uh, always nice to, to know the hard work and stuff has been impactful for other people just like it has for me. So thank you. So let's start with the, you know, the real nitty gritty. Um, what, what's the most surprising place one of your daughters has ever pooped? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. 
Um, you know, you know, I don't know. If it's necessarily surprising. It's more that like it's the times they are asked to do it. Like it's always like when you're at the restaurant right before your food arrives, and you know, it's right after you put them in like all their winter clothes or something like that. And you're like, oh my god, all right, we got to start all over again. You know, that's I think that's been the biggest surprise about parenting is like everything just takes so much longer. To, you know, you want to leave the house and it's a 45 minute project. Yeah. <laughs> and what do you do? You just adjust and you just start saying, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna plan to leave 45 minutes earlier than I usually yeah. would or is it just and it's you, terrible you, too cause I'm t- I'm like a I'm super type A I hate being late yeah. I just it, and kids like they always find a way to try to make you late so you always have to just be willing to roll the punches and stuff but you know I think it's like anything else it's a learned skill like my wife can round up the troops and get them going so much faster than I can just because she knows exactly which buttons to push and you know what to what to threaten to take away if we don't get our act together and stuff so I gotta I gotta pay more attention and watch how she coaches them up right so, so I, I just finished reading a book called Sapiens, which for anyone listening is absolutely incredible. Have you read that book? I haven't. No, it's going to have to go on my list. Great, great book. And towards the end, one thing that the, the author Yuval mentions is in regards to parents and their kids. And he says that when looking at, he he studied a lot of parents and when looking at the relationship, like parents would say, when looking at the relationship with their children, they tend to talk a ton about it being hard work. And they, you know, they think about just changing diapers and all of these things that are really challenging, time consuming, and in and of themselves, not very rewarding. Right. But as a whole, he found that almost every parent says that being a parent is the most meaningful role in their lives. So how does that, how does that kind of paradox resonate with you as a dad so far? And then also, what do you think that says about what makes life worth living like pleasurable experiences versus true happiness? Yeah. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, looking back, I'll never forget it. We had a, one of our baseball players, um, who had played professional baseball. He's actually retired now. He's, he's a close family friend now. He, um, they had a child, um, you know, right around the time that he was his last year of playing and I caught up to him, you know, eight or 10 months later. And he only had one at the time. He now has five kids. Um, they had twins just like us along the way, but, um, I'll never forget him saying to me, he's like, I never realized until I had kids how selfish I was. It's like, mm-hmm. I always ate when I wanted to. I slept when I wanted to, I trained when I wanted to. It was a very, like, it's a hedonistic way of living. And I look back on it and, you know, there are a lot of people that like praise me for, you know, being super productive in my early years and things like that. And it was because I was a single guy, like I had no social life. I just worked all the time and I trained when I wasn't working and you know that's what it was and you know you you get to this point now when you have quids, kids doing you know there are things that you could be doing but sometimes you're holding a screaming baby and you know sometimes it's you know you're, you're sitting next to your daughter while she's going potty and t- she wants to talk to you like you have those moments in your life that you know uh you know they're, they're certainly very important because your kids know when you're around and they they count on it and they expect you but um you know i think you, you always think about what your opportunity cost is and you know i think part of parenting is you know learning to realize that it's not what you're losing it's what you're gaining mm-hmm. Um, so you're having an opportunity to, to have a, a, a pronounced impact on who they are. And, you know, I think it also makes you like, uh, you know, realize that you should have been more grateful to your parents, like, you know, all the sacrifices they made for you to, right. to get you, not just, you know, financially and time wise mm-hmm. and all that, but just in terms of what else could they have been doing with their life. Um, I always remember my, my mom had a bunch of credits towards her master's degree, um, and when she got pregnant with me, she stopped pursuing it just because life was too crazy with the, my brother was four years older. So, um, and it, it literally took her like 20 years to go back and do it. And by that point, the credits had elapsed. So when she finally wrote her thesis, she, she dedicated her thesis to my brother and I, and she called us her, her first two masters, but looking back, <laughs> yeah. she walked away from a bunch of college credits, um, just so that she could be a good mom and, and watch over us. And, um, so I, I think you, you really, um, you know, that you have been selfish for a long time and it, it causes you to kind of, you know, redirect your focus. I think the, probably the thing I've, I've come to realize more than anything else though, is, you know, if we look at our training, right, it's all about balancing competing demands. And, and you certainly, you know, that better than anybody else working with CrossFit competitors and have been in that world. Like, you know, you've got to balance the strength component with the movement quality, with the metabolic conditioning, with all these different factors, the technical awareness. Um, you know, we certainly deal with that with our baseball guys. Like you can't just thrash 
stash them in the weight room all the time when they need to be, you know, not so fatigued that they can't pick up these fine motor skills. And, and really like parenting is the same way. You know, if, if you think about like, uh, you know, your opportunities to, you know, take on more and more professionally, like every time you do take on something more, you're, you effectively have to like ask yourself, does this outweigh an extra half hour with my daughters, you know? And, right. and those are really hard questions to ask because you have these professional goals that you have to reconcile with your family goals. So it's made me really think about like how I value my time and how I prioritize my, my, my work and the responsibilities. Right. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> there's really no right answer to that question. Like what, what do I want to be doing with that time? But if you say that family is first, right? Family is the most important, then you have to back that up with your actions. And just so many people say, you know, family is most important or friends are most important, but they spend 80% of their day working, right? And, And they don't necessarily have to, they do it out of either obsession or addiction or just plain old, you know, just not, not being disciplined with their time. Yeah, you know, one of the I read an article a couple of years ago, and, I, and I've talked about it a couple of times on podcasts and articles that I've, I've written. Um, Cheryl Sp- Sandberg from Facebook had a, yep. had an amazing quote. She's basically said, um, "If you think of work, family, friends, fitness, and sleep, pick three. And, and that's a it's incredibly accurate. Like I look at our our life, it's it's family, it's work, and it's fitness. I'm not a great sleeper. You know, we don't have like tons of like, you know, friends aside from the gym that we you know spend a lot of time with. Like we we make sacrifices in that regard, and you know, we start to realize, hey, socially, a lot more of our social endeavors are are going to baseball games to watch our clients play, or they're bringing the girls to the gym, and they know a lot of our staff and things like that. So you you realize that you you do have to kind of pick three of those like um you know from a training standpoint like i'm not the power lifter i used to be because i just don't sleep as much as i used to mm-hmm. um because you know work and you know and the family responsibilities have, have taken on more of a role for me so that was the most interesting you know kind of thing i had to kind of work my way through and it's it's hard because you know you you know how it is like you finish a training session you want to stick around and shoot the breeze with your training partners you know you want to play pickup hoops in the parking lot you want to do all these different things that you know you just can't do it when you know you got a couple of three-year-olds who are at home asking mommy when daddy's going to be home. Right. Yeah, that is interesting. <clears throat> and I, I like it to the extent that it helps people narrow their focus on things that matter. The The yeah. only time I would like personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that advice as if I feel really unbalanced in one yeah. of those areas. And that, that lack of balance is causing me some kind of like psychological, you know, uh, discomfort or whatever. Um, especially when it comes to like community and stuff like that or, or whatever it may be, everyone has their, their thing. But yeah, um, and I think it, it comes in, in spurts too, right? Like, yes. you know, you may put yourself on quarantine and, and do work for three days to get a big project done. And then you go on vacation with your family and you, you know, you shut off your iPhone and, and all that. So I, th- I think you just have to understand how to stratify your life and, and draw some lines. Right. So I want to set the stage a little bit for what you've become, which is one of the best strength and conditioning experts of all time. Uh, I know that in high school you had you struggled a little bit. Uh, yeah. You had a, you went through an eating disorder, an exercise addiction. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So I was. Um... I always joke I was kind of a fantastically mediocre athlete. Um, it's interesting, and I think in this industry you always hear, you know, strength coaches talk about like, man, if I just had this expertise when I was in my teenage years, I would have been playing in the NFL, or I would have been a major league pitcher, or something like that. I'm like, I, I might have had to str- scratch and claw to be a, a last guy on the bench on a Division One team if I really had good training and awareness. Um, you know, I was I was a guy that got recruited to play Division Three soccer and tennis. Mm-hmm. Um, I was more of a, a guy who had who had you know skills, but not necessarily athleticism. I was a pudgy kid that didn't run fast. You know, I was, I was probably more quick than I was fast, but neither of them were particularly good. Um, so I, you know, kind of my senior year in high school realized that, Hey, I, I want to play college sports. I need to really start pushing on this. And, you know, basically I, I always remember like right after my high school soccer season ended my senior year was, so it'd been 1998 in the fall. I was like, you know what, it's, it's time to get to this. And, and, you know, really just stopped on a dime, overhauled my, my diet and, you know, basically, you know, lost a ton of weight. So I dropped, you know, 50 or 60 pounds my senior year in high school. I was probably a buck 85 to a buck 90. So I, I went down to like the one thirties, the one twenties. Um, so it went 
went from being, you know, it was kind of one of those things where, all right, hey, I see my abs, I, I'm running faster, I'm more athletic, I feel good, and you know how it is, you can you can keep pushing that bar higher and higher, particularly when you're like a Type A guy like I am. You know, you see some success and you understand what's worked, and you know, we both know that what works in the short term doesn't necessarily work in the long term. So severe caloric restriction can work awesome for someone who's really overweight, and then you know, six months in, they're they're unhealthy. And and for me, it was actually probably more of like an exercise addiction than it was, you know, just like a you know a true eating disorder is that I, I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to be a college athlete, but I just didn't, I didn't have the tools at my fingertips to do it. Um, you know, I wasn't necessarily getting the mentorship that I needed. So, um, you know, long story short, I had multiple hospitalizations. Um, wow. in, basically I went to college my freshman year. I, I was too unhealthy to even think about playing sports and went to college my freshman year and, uh, I got a sinus infection, one of the, you know, like a month and a half in, it was a pretty tough go of it. And, uh, so, it, but w- w- it was a blessing in disguise in the sense that I went to college originally thinking I was going to be an accountant and I had all these health trials and tribulations and, you know, finally kind of righted the ship when I actually met a, a guy in my hometown who was, you know, a competitive natural bodybuilder. He'd work with some Olympic athletes and had just opened a gym in my hometown and you know I looked at him as a guy who was like all right there's a there's a guy who trains the way I want to train he eats the way I want to live you know I I I need someone that can kind of teach me that. And he was cool and took me under his wing and, you know, actually it wound up getting like a job working at the front desk at his gym. And, you know, it really, it opened my eyes to how I could take care of myself. And, you know, you know, it's, it's interesting how it kind of turned my life around, but it also led to me, um, you know, kind of making a switch and going into exercise science and, you know, ultimately finding my path, um, you know, later on when I got to the university of Connecticut and did my grad degree and learned that, you know, coaching athletes was what I want. But, you know, it's, I, I always crack up when, um, People magazine every year like releases that uh, that edition where they you know they do the half their size where you know the the 400 pound person gets down under 200 pounds yeah. and I'm like they need the double their size edition I mean I went from 97 and a half to at one point over 200 so it's definitely interesting uh, you know kind of where you know some of those struggles you have in your life wind up setting you up for success in other ways totally man so in your in the thick of it <clears throat> what was so you you started down this path of just wanting to lose weight to be a better athlete. At what point did it turn into like an addiction and what, and and like, what was the addiction about? What, what fueled it? And that's the funny thing about it is I, I think, you know, if you look at, you know, folks who have these issues, it's, it's always about some form of obsessive compulsive disorder, right? You see people, um, you know, women in the eating disorder world or even male, males who have eating disorders is, you know, there's, there are aspects of their life that they don't have control over, you know, so they find control wherever they can. You know, for some people, you know, you see women who, you know, have been abused by their husbands who wind up having eating disorders. You have some people who have severe alcohol problems and they can control food. Like, so there, there's different reasons that people take it on. And, you know, I look at me and I was a really high stress guy. Like I was, you know, salutatorian in my high school. I was, you know, going through the college application process. I had a lot of things that were kind of outside my control. And, you know, looking back, I was just a guy who probably wound up trying to find it wherever I can. And, um, you know, it wasn't until years later that I really learned how to use that to my advantage, like that go-getter mentality to, you know, devote it towards my training in a healthy capacity, towards writing, towards speaking, um, towards the things that I do today. I just, you know, try to redirect it for healthy initiatives. Right. But I don't know. There's like that one date on the calendar. You would say, all right, it, it switched from being good to bad. Um, but I, you know, the interesting about it is I, I can remember I, I was a tennis player in the spring and, you know, by that point I had lost a lot of weight. I was probably, you know, 135, 140 pounds or something like that. And I, I can always distinctly remember getting to school and I would dread walking up the stairs. I was so tired, like so underfed, like it was literally like a battle to walk upstairs and go to class, let alone like almost like stay awake during the day. But for some reason I could always like flip the switch when it came time, like, you know, have an afternoon match and, you know, I, I'd play in the afternoon. I want to be an all state in tennis, mm-hmm. like eating, you know, thousands and calories a day um you know i i'll never forget i actually I, I went through like this whole like state tournament and finished you know in the top eight in the state and when the the local newspaper actually announced the all state stuff i read it from my hospital bed wow um, that summer yeah so it's it's kind of crazy how like you know it's a really a, a I think it's like the power of the mind. Like you, you feel awful for 22 hours a day, but you know, you can flip the switch just for those two hours mm-hmm. to compete. Um, so it was, it was looking back, I, I, I wrestled with what the heck was I doing? And, you know, and you, you just don't understand what, you know, how you get kind of so off kilter, but, um, you know, that's just the, the nature of the beast when you're dealing with kind of obsessive compulsive is that it's hard to rationalize some of those behaviors. Right. From, from everyone that I've talked to that struggled with eating disorders, it, there also seems to be a component of, control, like power and control. It it gives you 
power over this very um Tr- like troubling part of a lot of kids lives right their yeah. their body image and whatnot and all of a sudden they they feel like they're in complete control of the way they they look yeah and you know what's actually a, it, for me it was, i mean it was, yeah it was a little bit of how i look you know i'd you know i don't want to say i've been bullied but I've, i'd had people pepper me with those comments over the years but you know what the thing i think for me was was interesting is like as i got more and more involved in this industry hearing how many people have gone through this right you know hear, hearing john romanello hearing adam bornstein like talking with like dozens and dozens of like the, the really well-known like fitness males in the industry how heavily common this is and, you know you're not hearing it from like the, you know, the division one college football, you know, strength coach who was a, you know, offensive lineman at some big time university or something like that. You're hearing it from a lot of the guys that are, that are really popular in like this online world we live in and stuff. It's, it's actually shockingly common, um, how, how it kind of works out. And in many cases, they've done something similar to what I've done. They've, they've figured out how to manage their, their very, very like driven nature to do more productive, you know, than destructive things. Right. So let's go, let's go back to your first coaching job. What was that? What was that experience like for you? Yeah, it's funny, you know, job for me was, you know, first one was like front desk and gradually kind of working my way into like a, a personal trainer role. But I think the one that I probably, you know, resonate as being the most profound for me was when I got to the University of Connecticut for grad school. Um, you know, I, I didn't know whether I wanted to do research. I didn't know whether I wanted to, you know, be a coach. I didn't know whether I, you know, wanted to go and just become a trainer or do something like that. So I was really kind of finding my way. Um, and I'll never forget, I I kind of just started doing some writing for T Nation at the time. And uh, uh, you know, because of our, you know, our, our human performance labs, you know, strong affiliation with the varsity weight room, you know, we got a chance to kind of go down and just lift with the, you know, the, the strength coaches in the athletic realm. And there was a guy named Brajesh Patel, um, who at the time was a graduate assistant at the University of Connecticut. Um, and he was, you know, was like two years older than me. And, you know, Brajesh had read like this recent article I had published on Teen Nation. He was like, hey, man, I really enjoyed your article. You know, feel free to hang out anytime. I was like, man, I'd love that. I'm still trying to kind of feel my way. And uh, he was like, hey, we got we got men's baseball conditioning tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. if you want to come. I was like, yeah, I'll be there. And I, and part of me thinks looking back, he was like testing me like, hey, is he going to take this seriously and actually show up? And I, I remember walking in the next morning. It was, I mean, I want to say it was like November in Storrs, Connecticut. Um, it was probably 10 degrees out side with, you know, a negative 30 wind chill. Um, and I just remember watching Brajesh coach and, you know, it's funny, a lot of the guys that were in that, that weight, weight room at the time were, you know, some of our college co- baseball coaches themselves, you know, they're almost, I think they're in their early thirties, but I just remember watching the way that he kind of commanded a weight room, um, how he was able to so efficiently, you know, change the quality of movement that he saw in front of him. Um, just, he was a very, very impactful coach and how the guys treated him, how they interacted with him. He was a, he was a friend, but at the same time, they, they clearly recognized him as someone that was that was having a, a dramatic impact on their career, and it, it, I, I, it was a huge day for me. I mean, those two hours made me want to be a strength and conditioning coach, and I've you know I've thanked him for that over the years. And um, you know, sure enough, there was another guy, Chris West, at the University of Connecticut, who you know took me under his wing to help out with men's, women's uh, uh, basketball and soccer. Tina Murray was there; she's now the director of Olympic sports at Louisville. And, um, you know, I, I had some awesome mentors at the university of Connecticut that, that effectively like brought me along to help out with their stuff. And it really nurtured my passion for, for strength and conditioning. And, you know, from there it was really about like, Hey, just develop your skill set. Um, you know, make yourself a, you know, a better coach and, you know, understand how to assess, understand how to program, understand how to coach, understand how to relate to athletes. Um, you know, and, and so, I, you know, it wasn't a paid gig. It was volunteer work in strength and conditioning. And my grad assistantship was actually paid by the U.S. Army and the research side of things, but I spent, you know, just as many hours, you know, on my own, just, you know, volunteering as much as I possibly could around high level athletes to, to understand that life. So one of, one of the things that you have credited to your success is this insane work ethic that you've already started to talk about a little bit, um, as both a professional athlete. And I, I don't know if I'm using the wrong term, but I, I know you're a very high level uh, power lifter, but also as a coach. And one of the things that you told me before the show is that this is something that's changed over the years since you've had kids. Yeah. So how has this affected your life and your work? 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people know me from like the powerlifting background and yeah, I, w- I was heavily involved in it from probably 2003 to 2007. I haven't done a meet since December of 2007. Okay. Um, you know, most people know me now for, you know, <laughs> like heavy lifting on YouTube or something like that or Instagram. Um, you know, so I actually, you know, I kind of made that conscious decision. We started our first gym in 2007 and, you know, I, I had met my wife that year. Um, she was my girlfriend at the time. And I, I realized that, you know, I, if I'm going to leave town for a couple days to, you know, have to weigh in, lift at the meet, travel, go through all this craziness and stuff. Um, you know, those, that time was probably better directed to something else in my life, whether it was spend, you know, making up for time that I was missing with family because I was working so hard in entrepreneurship or, you know, it was, you know, better spent on, you know, longer term projects to, to set me up for the systems that I need for the future. So I, I kind of made a, a somewhat conscious decision to step away from powerlifting. Um, I also had some, some shoulder issues that didn't jive super well with back squatting. So it was, it was something I was comfortable doing. And it's, it's funny. I, I, I never stopped training for it though. Um, you know, like that was 2007. I, I can remember there was a day in the fall of 2012 when I woke up one day I felt pretty good it was like a Wednesday morning and I hadn't I hadn't trained on Tuesday I texted one of our staff members I was like hey you mind you mind handling for me today he's like yeah no problem I'm gonna be lifting anyway so he came in I, I weighed in at 180.5 um I came in that day I squatted 455 I benched 350 and I deadlifted 635 so I basically totally raw it was like it was a 1435 total and I did it like an hour and a half so it was wow you know it was, it was a good powerlifting total I just I didn't really, I, I didn't like approach it in like the, Hey, I'm going to take a one week deload and I'm mm-hmm. going to travel. I'm going to do a 24 hour weigh and all this stuff. Like, so for me, lifting heavy is just like, you know, it's part of who I am and what I do and, you know, I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I, I think it gives me a frame of reference for, for dealing with our athletes, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily identify myself as a power lifter anymore. I, I'm probably more of a dad than I am a power lifter. <laughs> yeah. So what, what is your, let's see, how, do, how, how does this, uh, resonate with you? I think that the term, like the concept hard work is actually overvalued in our society. Specifically, I think that people just glorify just the grind and to the extent that they don't do, they, they forgo a lot of like deep thinking and um, it, it stops them from focusing on what matters because a lot of people just think I'm just going to outwork the next person rather than thinking, how am I going to, you know, work smarter? And I think this trickles over to the way that they, they coach athletes. And then the way that, that athletes, um, you know, treat their own training. Well, how does that resonate with you? Yeah. You know, I think there's, there's, you have to really stratify it into two distinctly different demographics in the, in the population, right? Mm-hmm. The, the first part of the population is like there is a chunk of people on this planet. You know, obviously the, the people who don't exercise at all, they don't train at all, anything like that. Um, and, and certainly people who are new to this and people who have been at it a long time that don't know really how to work hard. Like, you know, if you, you and I have, have both had crazy training sessions, I mean, I, I spent a year of my life at Southside gym in Southern Connecticut, where I was like the lightest guy in the history of the gym. And every Sunday morning I got in and I, I squatted with a bunch of guys that outweighed me by 150 pounds. And, you know, they'd throw eight, nine hundred pounds on their back. And I would literally just do everything I possibly could to keep up. It was like, you know, basically squat or die. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like there were a lot of those training sessions where I was like, like consistently nine out of 10. And like, there were days when it was like 10 out of 10, like where I was fighting back, you know, throwing up in the car on the ride home, like where I, I literally just, I couldn't do anything for the rest of the day because I had been beaten up so badly training like that. Like, and the issue is there are a lot of people that don't ever even come close to a six out of 10, let alone a nine or a 10 out of 10. Right. They, they don't know how to tap into that. And I mean, there's research that supports that. Like beginners can get strong on as little as, you know, 40% of one RM when they get going, like as a more advanced lifter, you're not going to get stronger unless you're consistently at 85, 90 plus percent. And like, I just don't think there are a lot of people that have like that mental fortitude to go and throw like a really heavy bar on their back or on their, in their hands and like consistently do it week in and week out. So I do think there's a huge chunk of the population. That, that needs to figure out how to, you know, get more accustomed to being really, really uncomfortable with their training. Cause that's at the end of the day, that's how high level folks force adaptation. Right. Um, and I, I see that even on the professional side of things, there are guys that are just very comfortable and they get by a natural talent, even though they never pushed at it. Um, and I, and I do think that's something that you train, like you, you train how to compete and know how to flip it on and flip it off because like, 
Max Scherzer is one of our clients with the Nationals, and I watch the way Max trains. Like every training session is about trying to find ways to compete, trying to find ways to evolve exercises, how to get the people around him to push him harder. And he's one of those guys that, like, literally, you watch him you know, on a mound in the big leagues, and he's, he's literally just a he's a psychopath. Like yeah. he's storming around the field, you know, and he can take over a game like that, and he can motivate his teammates in that regard. So I I think that's an untapped skill. At the same time, though, I know for me personally, I can get to those eights, nines, tens very, very regularly if I want to, but they're not what dictates my training success right now. My my training success 100% has to do with I just don't sleep enough. Like I, I need to find better ways in my life to reduce stress. Uh, you know, if I want to add 50 pounds to my deadlift, it's probably a year and a half of training, way bigger focus on, you know, sleep quality and, you know, optimizing nutrition perfectly and fine tuning my training programs and all that stuff. And you're right. I think there are a lot of high level guys who do need to work smarter instead of we're just working hard. But those are really challenging things to reconcile because it's, it's not fair meat for me to say to one of our major league guys who trains his butt off, like, Hey, you know what? Just ignore those three kids of yours. Like don't right. go on vacation in the off season, even though they haven't seen you for the last seven months while you've been playing 200 games in 230 days. So I think you have to really take it on a case by case basis. There are people that work hard that need to work smart and there are people that have no idea what it's like to work hard. Right. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. So you, you work with people that are literally making $10 million per year. So how do you onboard athletes like this in a way that gains their trust outside of just, you know, so-and-so like one of your athletes referred another athlete. So-and-so said you were the best. So you're the best. How, what does that conversation sound like? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, if the first thing I would tell you is that, you know, the biggest misconception I can tell you about the difference between like, we call them the pros and the Joes, like the, you know, the professional athletes and then the, the ordinary, you know, general pop clients we train, they're actually not much different. They both appreciate, you know, training economy, getting the most bang for their buck. Um, you know, so they're, they're very comparable in that regard. And I think you really have to emotionally separate them yourself from, from who they are, right? It doesn't matter what their paycheck is or like that. You have to come back to, to principles of, of success, you know, how do they move? Um, you know, what's their training history look like? Those are the things that you have to really ask. And certainly there's a level of specialization that goes with evaluating a professional, you know, baseball player specific to his needs as compared to, you know, just a guy who sits at a computer all day. So, um, you know, I, I think where we've had a lot of success is, is trying to make complex topics really simple. Um, but, but really being very, very meticulous in the way we coach without feeling like we're, we're uh, micromanaging people. Like we're, um, we're, we're sticklers for technique, um, how we do our rotator cuff exercises, how we, you know, coach pitching mechanics, things along those lines. But, you know, I, I think what we do a good job of is relating them to the athletes and also not being long winded. We try to be very succinct and, mm -hmm. and efficient with our coaching cues so that it doesn't feel like it's inherently interfering with the training process. So, um, I think, you know, attention to detail is, is really big. It's really interesting. You talk about the simplicity aspect, <clears throat> every, Every like master of strength and conditioning that I've talked to, such as you, Dan, John, Mike Boyle, those types of guys, there's always an ele element of simplicity and yeah. they're, they're able to take really, really complex topics and just boil them down to the, the very few essential things in each of those topics. Yeah, I, I think it's huge. And though, I mean, Dan and Mike are, are amazing examples of this. Like, you know, Mike and I joke, like he got his first job at Boston University in strength and conditioning the year I was born, 1981. So he's been at this, you know, a, a really, really long time. And, you know, like the, the basics are the basics for a reason. They, they, they have withstood the test of time and they work, um, you know, but I, but I think the challenging part about it is, you know, over the years we've found better ways to coach him, right? Mm -hmm. We've, we've found better ways, um, you know, to evaluate whether they're actually working, you know, right. so, you know, the, the meat and potatoes maybe hasn't changed, but maybe the, the plate we serve it on the, the fork we eat it with the salad that comes with it. Those are the things that I think have evolved. Right. So you work primarily with baseball players, although you're working with uh, a lot of different athletes. I know in my experience, it seems like baseball players more than any other sport are treated like uh, they're, they're treated as being more fragile. So my question is, do you think, why do you think that is? And do you think it's warranted? Yeah. So I think, um, there's two things you have to consider. First off, the unique thing about baseball players, um, is that 
in many cases, they're successful because of traits slash characteristics as opposed to just athleticism, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know you'll see some dumpy bodies in the major leagues, right? You'll see guys that, you know, big old beer bellies that throw the ball 98, right? Maybe it's because they've got a ton of laxity or they've just fine-tuned this one specific motion and become very, very efficient at it. You know, we see guys that are successful because they got really long fingers and it makes it easier to throw a great split or a change up, right? We see guys that pitch at a high level because they've got a good curveball. So, you know, big leaguers really come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you know, they got guys that are successful because they have really good vision and it, it makes them better hitters. So, um, you know, we have to be on cognizant of that. Certainly we have to work to enhance athleticism and, um, but we have to be aware of the fact that in there many cases there are going to be, you know, success stories that aren't easily explained by just what the guy does in the weight room or how fast he runs or how high he jumps. So right. I think that's the first side of it. But what's different about baseball, I think when we talk about like the kind of the babying them trend is where baseball is unique is, is throwing a baseball is the single fastest motion ever recorded in sports. The, the humerus internally rotates at about 7,000 degrees per second in major league baseball pitchers during the act of throwing. So, I mean, that's the equivalent of taking the ball and having it rotate over 20 times per second in the socket. So it's just an insane amount of force. Um, and then there's some, you know, extreme positions that you get to in the, in the delivery. And what's hard is that sometimes those extreme positions and extreme velocities slash forces in many cases are, uh, protected against by very, very small structures, right? So at an elbow, your ulnar collateral ligament is not a dramatically large anatomical structure. <clears throat> and for some athletes, that's, that's the limiting factor. Like a ligament becomes the, the roadblock to being able to apply a hundred miles an hour worth of force to an elbow. Um, so I, I think they're, you know, that's the reason why we see them getting babied a little bit more where I think we've been able to be very successful um, in our industry is that, you know, we, we appreciate those functional demands of throwing and the unique adaptations that a lot of these athletes have in terms of asymmetries they've acquired and, you know, some of them favorable, some of them unfavorable. Um, but we haven't gone to an extreme, right? We've, we've said, Hey, you can actually push these guys very, very hard. As long as you, you choose the right exercises and you do them at the right times of year and with the right people. What's traditionally happened in the baseball population is they've been very underserved because there's been a, a population that said, Hey, just don't train them. Like just give them the foo foo rotator cuff exercise program with some bands, mm -hmm. you know, nothing more than 10 pound dumbbells, do some wrist curls and you're good to go. And at the other spectrum, we've had like, you know, the strength coach just hands them the football program and says, all right, just clean squat bench and you're going to be good to go. And that hasn't worked either. There's right. a, there's a happy medium between those two ends of the spectrum. And, and I think we've been able to, to do very, very well. Um, you know, not only programming in it, but, but justifying why we do what we do. Right. At the, at the bot, like kind of at the bottom line, is it not like your work is about not over patterning what they're already doing, correct? Yeah, I think there's that side of it. You know, baseball, you know, specificity is great until it isn't, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like think about it, like in your world, right? There you, you'll see guys that go on like squat specialization programs, right? right. And they're going to squat three days a week for 12 weeks. And, you know, they add 80 pounds to their squat. And then they wind up with a patellar tendinopathy that sticks around for, for six years, right? So, yep. you know, you have like this certain amount of specificity that's great because you need that to group patterns. But the challenge becomes if you have too much specificity, you know, there are, there are biomechanical limitations to it. So, you know, I think that's what we see in baseball is throwing a baseball is the single most specific act in really all sports. Like the more you deviate from your pitching mechanics, the less likely you are to be successful. So, you know, it's, it's our job to give them movement variability in their daily lives. Um, so as to not overwhelm them. And that's why we're seeing so many injuries nowadays is that you're seeing kids who just want to throw baseballs off a mound 12 months out of the year. And then those same kids who develop with these, you know, overuse patterns, all that stuff, they get bigger, they get stronger, they get older. And all of a sudden the forces on those shoulders and elbows become so significant that they blow out, you know, the second they're college players or professional players or something like that. Right. So how do you, how does that conversation go for you? I, I was thinking about it before the show and I would, I would imagine that just telling people about the potential risk in the future is probably a pretty bad motivator because kids I know for sure can't see, you know, they can't see three months into the future, much less years. And I, and I feel like parents a lot of times are the same way. Uh, it seems like you would have to show them that it's going to be a performance enhancement, kind of like training to be more balanced. Uh, what does that conversation look like? 
I think it's, instead of trying to frame it as here's the downside, uh, we frame it as here's someone who's had remarkable success and here's the path that he took. Mm -hmm. And by this point, we have those sample sizes. We have 125 plus guys drafted since 2011. We trained both Cy Young award winners last year. We, we probably, you know, in spring training this year, we trained four of the top eight pitchers in strikeouts in Major League Baseball. Like, you know, you, you literally can't go a day when there isn't a, one of our clients pitching a game in the big leagues. Like, we have guys with all 30 Major League organizations. I can call just about any college in in the country on the first ring and talk to their pitching coach or whoever it is. So like we we've really like, I, I think our track record of success basically says like, trust us, you right. know? And, and so it gets easier when, you know, I have a 15 year old kid that thinks he needs to go to every showcase under the sun. And I can say, Hey, you know what? That's Tyler Beatty over there. He's a giant's number one prospect. He's been a first round pick twice, won a national championship at Vanderbilt was a finalist for the golden spikes award. Here's how he did it. Hey, you want to yeah. talk to Tyler? I'm sure he'd be able to, you know, share some wisdom with you. Um, like those things are really powerful. And, you know, and what you realize is like our pro guys are thrilled in most cases to, to have those conversations mm -hmm. um, because they, they have a vested interest in the future of the game. They want the best players, you know, developing. They want kids to be high on baseball because it means there are going to be more people going to major league games and, you know, watching TV when their World Series is on and stuff. Like they, they whether they realize it or not, they care about the future of the game and it, it's important that kids are healthy in order to enjoy it. So how do, how do these guys, all of these pros, the best of the best, how do they know that you're doing a good job with them? How do they know it's working? Because, and the reason I ask is because a lot of times I, I, I would assume like when someone doesn't get injured, it's not yeah. like you don't really notice that. Yeah, it's like if you go to a if you go to a good restaurant, right? How often do you write a recommend a uh, review on Yelp? Probably never, right? Right. But if you go and it, the food's cold and there's a hair in your salad or something like that, you're mm -hmm. like going online to tear them apart. So you know, I, I think that's that's the challenge in any industry, uh, whether you own a restaurant or you're a lawyer or a doctor or anything like that, is people don't necessarily rave about successes as much as they complain about failures. So you know, I I think for us. Um, one thing I'm a, a huge, huge believer in is is the communication aspect of it. Um, you know, I want them to feel like they have an active role in the planning process. You know, I, I do a lot of listening and ask a lot more questions, um, particularly being a kind of a baseball outsider myself. Um, so I, I think the other thing is I, I give those guys an active role in, you know, kind of the, the discussion process. So like, like Noah Syndergaard of the New York Mets is one of our guys. Noah will like send me like programming requests like a week out from when he's about to start a new month of programming. Like mm -hmm. he'll say, Hey, I really like this. What do you think about including this? Like he really loved using like the Versapoli, a lot of the eccentric overload stuff. He's like, I feel like this helps a lot. What do you, what's your take? So, you know, I, I think you have to understand who's your athlete, right? You're going to have some athletes that they just want the what. Like they trust you for your expertise and they're going to say, just tell me what to do. Right. Mm -hmm. You're going to have other athletes that want to learn the why. Um, you're going to have some athletes that feel like they have a pretty good routine set aside, but they want you more for the how, right. They want you to push them when you think that they're dogging it a little bit. Um, they want you to maybe coach them up on specific things. So you, you try to meet them wherever they're at. Um, and, and you realize like a, you know, everyone that we have is different in that regard. Like I have, I have, you know, pro athletes that know that they're big time visual learners where they'll just be like, show me. I have other guys where I can say one word and they get it. So you try to figure out what makes guys tick and then plan accordingly. I think that's what, you know, verify, that's what supports a lot of the long-term success. Certainly there are, you know, radar gun readings and, you know, you know, there's a guy like, like Logan Morrison, you know, the, with the Minnesota Twins, a long-term client of ours. Like Logan was a guy who had a pretty involved knee surgery early in his career and never really kind of came back from it and started up with the fall of us uh, in the fall of 2014. And, you know, it came back and his, his knees have been great ever since. And, you know, we were joking this past fall. I'm like, we haven't even talked about your knees in like two years, you know? So like for him, like just not being in pain on a daily basis was, you know, the biggest takeaways from some of our training programs. So, um, you know, I think that everyone has their different definition of success and mm -hmm. you just have to, you know, kind of meet them where they're at. So obviously through years and years of coaching, you're going to, if you're intentional about getting better at listening for that kind of thing, you're going to get yeah. better at it. Is there anything uh, that you do deliberately to, uh, or, or, or tactic, 
uh, tacti- tactically, <laughs> tactically to listen better and, and make sure you're communicating with athletes on their level the way that they want to or, or even the way that you teach the coaches that work under you to do so? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I always emphasize is that, you know, the 80-20 rule applies to our assessments as well. On that first day when we have an athlete um, coming in, I want to make sure that we only talk 20% of the time. And this is interesting because a lot of times we'll have other coaches that will sit in with me, um, you know, and, and kind of like, you know, because we take a teamwork approach to working with a lot of our athletes. So multiple coaches may be in the room. We do that assessment. And, you know, so I want to be really careful about having them talk too much. I want to – I have specific questions I want to ask. Um, you know, I want to solicit feedback from the athlete and, and really try to get that going. So, um, you know, I think that's some of it. And there, there's all kinds of other stuff too is, you know, like there are subtle things that you can do, not just from like an eye contact thing, like using people's name more often, both so that you remember it and so that they recognize that you're paying attention, mm-hmm. meticulously going over health histories. Like one of the things I, I, I learned in the past like year or two that I always use is I lower my chair when I do an evaluation for a female athlete. Like just little things like that. Like if, if you actually look at like a lot of the behavioral research and how you build rapport with people, um, those are really, really big. So we actually, we, we, for all of our new interns, um, they go through a 10 week online training course, uh, of pretty much, you know, everything you need to know to, to be successful from, you know, here's how we go through our assessments to here's how you coach this exercise, this one, this one, you know, here's, uh, you know, how you kind of interpret our programming templates, this, that, and the other. And the last one they go through before they arrive is, is a presentation called 25 ways to build rapport on a client's first day. You know, what are the things you talk about? How are you, how do you, you know, ask questions to show interest in them? What are the topics you stay away from? from, um, you know, what are things to be cognizant of? Like, Hey, our professional baseball players, it annoys them when you say, Hey, isn't it cool how you get to play for the San Francisco giants? Like, no, you're better off asking them if they have had their fantasy football draft yet or something like that. Um, so it's just a, we really try to nurture the fact that like, this is like that, that extra place, right? There's home, there's school slash work, and then there's the gym. We want you to feel like this is your spot. Right, where they can relax and be themselves rather than another place where they have to be on. Yeah. That's so it. I love that. Yeah. Is that is that a uh is that a course that's available to people that aren't your interns? No, it's funny. We've uh, we've always just kind of kept it in house because it's always been like kind of an evolving project. Yeah. Um you know, just so we make sure, but we everyone's always been like, Man, you need to make that available and you need to sell it. So I don't know, maybe at some point we'll get our act together and put it out there. Yeah, that sounds great, man. Love it. <laughs> So I know uh, I want to ask you about a couple specific programming or, or exercise related things. Sure. Uh, I know that one of the thing, and and I think I'm I think I'm correct in saying this. You're you're against b- having baseball players do Olympic lifting and specifically snatching, uh, maybe maybe all Olympic lifts. Um, and my question is, if someone has the appropriate range of motion and the time to build those skills. Would you think that movements like power cleans could be valuable for baseball players? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so let me give you the little bit of the backstory on kind of where a little bit of this originated. So all the way back in 2010, um, I wrote an article for Teen Nation called What I Learned in 2009. And basically one of the key points for the article was that – I'd seen a lot of guys that had these like 16, 17, 18 inch vertical jumps who threw 95 and it made no sense to me, right? Guys who were seemingly very unathletic, who could, you know, throw harder than 99.9% of people on the planet. Um, and so, you know, it got me to thinking a little bit more as like, Hey, maybe power development is very plane specific, meaning that just because you can run fast, jump high, um, do things in a very straight ahead way, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be an elite performer on a rotational, you yeah. know, kind of things, right? So, you know, we've, we've all watched like, you know, guys who like play in the NBA go and try to throw out the first pitch in a baseball game. And it's like a, you know, it's terrible, you know, stuff like that. So, um, you know, it just makes you think about it a little bit. And it was funny, right after that article was published, I got an email from a guy named Graham Lehman. Um, he was up in Canada. He was doing his, his uh, master's thesis. And he's like, you know, it's funny. We're actually studying exactly this. And our early findings really support everything that you're saying. I was like, all right, that's cool. And, you know, he kind of sent me some of the preliminary stuff. And then it came out in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. They had done a study, um, you know, on some college pitchers and basically found that the only thing that predicted pitching velocity in them was a rotational med ball throw for distance and a a single leg lateral hop, kind of like a skater jump, um, for yeah, distance. Yeah. 
it, sprinting speed, vertical jump, broad jump did not predict pitch and velocity at all. Wow. Right. So some of your best freak athletes, the guys that jumped out of the gym on their high school basketball teams and, you know, ran the, the four five forties and things like that. Those weren't the guys throwing the hardest. It was the guys that were the most efficient rotationally. So it was very eye opening and it made me realize, Hey, like we need to be very specific in the way that we train power. Um, and that's where we, we got more and more involved with, with medicine ball work, more and more involved with, uh, you know, like weighted ball throwing things along those lines. And, and it's really, really paid off. Like we've, we've had a, a good track record of not just building velocity in guys, but, you know, but also in doing so and keeping them healthy at the same time. So I think that from a pure performance side of things says, all right, there's justification for including these things in our program you know, does it push something else out? And that's where, you know, Olympic lifts would theoretically be pushed out. Right. Um, look at how kind of that strength speed continuum goes about. The other thing is you have to realize that there, you know, we, we, we certainly can build technically proficiency and all that stuff, um, and, and develop really, really good peak power, no doubt about it. But, you know, the question is always going to be, is there's, there going to be a limitation to, you know, like to the joints, right? So yeah. you can't just snatch overhead. You're always going to have an element of valgus stress. Um, if you have hypermobile guys, you're going to have more of an element of elbow hyperextension. So you're, you're on a collateral ligament on the catch of a snatch. It takes on some stress. Like at, uh, two Olympics ago, we saw, you know, an Olympic competitor who tore his UCL trying to make an overhead catch. Um, obviously, that's at the extreme levels of competition. Now, not necessarily something you'd see every day in a college weight room or something along those lines. But you know, the proof is in the pudding that, you know, there certainly is a lot of wrist, hand, shoulder stress, um, and, and certainly elbows as well. So I think what I would say is if you are going to include some of the Olympic lists, just get rid of the catch do some high pulls, do some jump shrugs, things along those lines. You're probably going to get, you know, good benefit from there. Cause you are going to have guys in your team, center fielders, people need to just run fast and jump high. And, um, I don't have a problem with people including them as long as they're taught correctly. Um, and you know, you're just, you're just aware of not, you know, putting those, those more, uh, higher risk components, you know, into each one of those lifts. Right. I mean, the most interesting thing that you just said is that, is that study. Uh, I, I had not heard about that. Is there, have there been other studies, uh, on that same topic? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't followed up on it. Um, but I'd be willing to bet that they'd be able to reproduce it based on at least what I've seen in the trenches. But, I um, mean, that's a good one. I, now you mentioned, I'm gonna have to look at it because I think it was published in 2012. So it's been a few years. I wonder if there has been some follow-up stuff that I may not have seen. Yeah, that's huge. What, uh, what kind of, like how significantly have you been able to improve, say someone's med ball throw? Yeah, and here's the the challenging part about it. Med ball stuff is actually really hard to quantify, right? Right. So, I mean, yes, we can go outside and we can measure the distance thrown on and everything like that. Um, we tried using like the push bands to actually try to, you know, measure power in the weight room. They don't always stay attached to the wrist very well. Uh, we tried even using like radar guns on some of the med ball stuff. It's hard stuff to actually quantify. Um, probably the best way to quantify is the noise it makes, um, you know, and, and that's the thing that's really, really challenging. But there are other ways where you can maybe quantify some stuff obviously you have like use like a verse pulley for rotational stuff you can get some readings you can use some of the kaiser stuff um you know and actually get some wattage on some of these things but yeah i mean you could you could theoretically go out and do a rotational med ball throw for distance if you really wanted to but in the context of the training that we're doing it's probably not an efficient use of our time right so have you have y'all started recruiting interns with like really good hearing we should we should <laughs> <laughs> So an, another one of the exercises is uh, o just overhead lifting for pitchers. Yeah. Uh, do you think pitchers should be lifting overhead? And then what about, especially for kids, in terms of a uh, looking at like a functional movement aspect of that? Yeah, I, I have no problem with overhead lifting. Um, I would just say that not all overhead lifting is is created equal, right? Um, you know, like a, a bottoms up, you know, waiter's walk with a right. kettlebell is an overhead lift. Like a Turkish getup is an overhead lift. A, a yoga push up would technically be an overhead lift. A TRXY or a chin up would be an overhead lift. So, you know, I think you know the question you have to ask is what kind of of lift is it? We use a lot of like landmine presses as a way to kind of drive some good scapular upper rotation. I don't know that we do a lot of like traditional just like like overhead press or jerk, you know, with our baseball guys, you know, I think there, there are ways that we can maybe drive the patterns that we want a little bit more, um, you know, with functional carryover, but, mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think you vilify an entire category of exercise just because the amount of, you know, shoulder flexion that's present. Right. So you work with some of the premier names in sports in general. 
Uh, do you ever find yourself having to fire a client because of their unwillingness to comply with your methodology? You know, what's interesting. Uh, I've, I've never really had that experience. Um, and I, and I think the reason is very simple. I think there's a little bit of like a velvet rope around our business. Um, I think we, we've established probably a solid enough branding at this point where we, we kind of weed out a lot of people that aren't really serious about taking their training right. you know, seriously. Yeah, you know, I think those guys, you know, wind up elsewhere or whatever it may be. And the guys that come in here are actually really good about kind of, uh, you know, deferring to us, coming there for our mentor, our mentorship and our, our ex- expertise. Um, so I can't say that I've ever really had that problem. Um, it's actually kind of a nice thing. Certainly you have athletes that may frustrate you because they're, you know, maybe their actions of today don't align with their goals for tomorrow and you right. want to try to try to help them towards it. And it's, it's a challenge to get through to them sometimes. But, um, no, I, I think for the most part we have, we have athletes that, you know, that certainly, uh, defer to our expertise in most cases. So I, I very rarely have frustrating stuff in that regard. How much of what you do has to do with, um, the psychology or behavioral aspect of, uh, strength and conditioning and, and kind of sport development. Oh, it's huge. Um, you know, you, you can't separate the two. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I always joke like the, you could have, I'd rather have the worst program ever written with hundred percent intensity execution as opposed to a perfect program, you know, exercise with no, enthu- exercise with no enthusiasm or drive or anything like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's our job to make sure that we create an environment that puts guys in a position to be successful. Um, and that's where the psychology of training really kicks in. What do you, th- what do you see in strength and conditioning coaches out there that like, what, what are, what are a couple of the biggest mistakes you see them making in, in terms of that? Like, uh, what, you know, one thing you just mentioned is the perfect, pro- like people writing the perfect program and then athletes not, n- not executing any of it. You know, what, what are yes. some of the biggest mistakes being made out there? You know, I, I think a big part of it is not giving athletes enough ownership in the process. Um, you know, not basically making them part of that planning process. You're going to get better buy-in if an athlete feels like it was some of his ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's, you know, like I, I use the example of Noah, obviously, but, you know, there are a lot of athletes that are like that. They want you to listen to what's worked and what hasn't so that they feel like it's very fine-tuned to their needs. I think that's a big part of it for sure. Um, you know, I think they want to be able to see progression, um, you know, and everybody evaluates progression. Obviously, a powerlifter is going to evaluate evaluate progression based on how much weight's on the bar, but, you know, pitching guys are, are, are certainly going to evaluate progression based on how sharp their slider is or what their fastball velo is or whatever it may be. So I, I, I think that, you know, being able to monitor progress, but at the same time have a, have a, a significant ownership role in the, the entire process is, is a very, you know, very quick ways to build more buy-in. Right. It's funny. I literally talked about this on another podcast a couple hours ago. Uh, it seems just like a, a way to get people to commit to a process better, right? When they feel yeah. like they have more, even, even autonomy in the, in the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, you see that with your children as well. You like, they just, you know, if you get them involved on like cooking dinner, like they're more likely to eat their dinner. Like it's just right. a, it's an interesting dynamic that I've definitely seen at work. And, um, I mean, it's just, it's human behavior. You know, they, they want to feel like they're, they're part of something bigger than themselves. Right. That's great advice. When should an athlete take a chance, if ever, in training to get their performance to the next level as opposed to uh, staying safe? You know, that's a, it's hard. That's a, it's kind of a gray area question, right? If you have a, you know, and I'll use this example, actually, we had a a guy drafted in 2008. he was Ivy League Pitcher of the Year. His name was Sean Haviland. Um, Sean was a 33rd rounder, I believe, by the Oakland A's. He pitched at 88 to 90 miles an hour in, in college. And I can remember, you know, right after he drafted, he started up with us right after his first kind of half season in pro baseball. And I was like, hey, just so you know, like you're a you're a 5'11 righty that throws 88 to 90. You're very much the definition of dime a dozen. Like mm-hmm. you can do what everybody else does and, you know, you can kind of like just – you know, get by and probably have a short career or you can really push and get better. Um, otherwise you're not going to be sticking around and sure enough, Sean like bought in, you know, did an aggressive throwing program, totally changed his diet, lifted a ton that off season and, and made a big change. And he was 91 to 94 the following year, touched wow. 95 miles an hour. And, you know, he's a Midwest league all-star. There was a California league all-star and he, he kind of surged through the system. So, 
you know, I, I look back on that one. It was like, that was a time when it was right to take a chance, right? It's also right to take a chance. If you got a guy who's, you know, 31 years old, he's tried everything. It seems like under the sun, you know, to get better. And he's not quite there in the big leagues. And those are the guys that, you know, they may have to take more risks in their programs. Maybe it's a more aggressive throwing program. Maybe it's, it's gaining weight more aggressively. You know, there, there's something that they need to do differently to overhaul their performance. If they're going to have, you know, a, a continued chance to, to make a living playing this game. Conversely, I'm not going to take chances with Max Scherzer. You know, Max has thrown 180 innings or more, like nine years in a row. Um, he's one of only four guys, or excuse me, one of, one of only three guys in baseball who's thrown more than 200 innings each of the last four years. He's got three Cy Young Award win, wins under his belt. Like, Max has, has figured out how to be successful in the major leagues. Right now, it's our job to make it sustainable. So, you know, when we train Max, we're not taking unnecessary risks. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be smart about putting him in a position to be successful, particularly as he ages. And, you know, same would be true of, you know, Kluber or Syndergaard or any of the other guys we work with. So I think you have to understand the, the dynamic, but what I would also tell you is like, think about the average person, like in, in just the general population world, there really isn't a whole lot of reasons to take risks, right? If, if I'm a, you know, a 400 pound deadlifter and I really think I have more in me and I'm, hey, I'm going to jump right to 450. Well, what's a 50 pound jump, right? Like there's a lot that could go wrong with that, right? right. Um, if I have debilitating back pain, that makes me a worse, you know, father, husband, uh, business owner, yeah. you know, it ruins my sleep quality, but the upside is just incredibly low. Like there's nothing that's going to be better right. about my life. Like my kids aren't going to love me anymore if I deadlift to 450 and think like that. And I've, I've kind of wrestled with that as I've thought about, do I want to make this run at a 700 deadlift? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential downside to it. It's a lot of opportunity costs. So, you know, I think you have to weigh those things out. It might be perfectly appropriate for someone, you know, who's, who's like competing in the CrossFit games and they need to add 15 pounds to their, their power clean. Like those guys might need to take more chances in training because there is, there is big upside, right? They might be perform at a high level if they can demonstrate that they can do that so but for our general pop guys probably not worth risking nearly as much sometimes those people just need to have a, a, a lot of consistency in their training to get to where they want to be right i mean from a twenty thousand foot perspective it's so easy to see like there's just yeah. no point you know yeah just, or, or almost no point but when you're in the middle of it and i've i've yeah. been guilty of this as, as much as anybody it's just we're, we're so ego driven you know, and we yeah. think another 20 pounds is just going to make life, life so much better. And it really has almost no effect. Yeah. I have, it's funny. I have a, I had a client, um, I used to train two like middle-aged guys, their best friends. They would come in and train together at like 11 to 12, um, three mornings a week and awesome guys. Both had they basically made a fortune and were retired by 50. Um, and we would train. It was like the funnest hour of my week. Those guys would like yell at each other across the room and bust each other's chops. And I remember distinctly one of them, like push the prowler, like got through like a 30 yard set or whatever. And he's on the floor, just like gasping for air. And he looks up at me. He's like, man, you know, I only do this so that I can eat pizza and drink beer during the Patriots game yeah. and not feel bad about myself. I'm like, all right, I'm an idiot. Like, I'm, you know, I'm here crushing these guys. And I mean, we're having a good time and everything, but you really look at it. I'm like, he, he's here. He's at this for a much different reason than I think he's at this. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was kind of like a good, like little reminder right there. I'm like, all right, this is, this is their goal. It's not mine. Right. So I want, I want to hear about your athletes off season and, and specifically because in, in our world, in the CrossFit world, I know I can probably count on, on two hands, how many athletes take a, a real off season where they're rejuvenating and really letting their bodies and minds rest. And I assume, uh, you're, you're seeing a much different, uh, a, a much, much different thing in professional sports. So what is an off season of a, an MLB player look like? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think it depends if we're, if we're talking about true big leaguers, um, typically the, the regular season will wrap up the first couple of days in October. If they go into the playoffs, it can go all the way till the end of October. Um, but we'll assume, you know, a team that doesn't make the playoffs, they, they wrap up October 3rd. Um, one of my, the banes of my existence is when I hear somebody say, I'm just going to take a month off. Mm -hmm. um, that drives me bonkers. A month is such a long time in a baseball calendar. Um, I, I actually prefer to get guys back in relatively quickly um, for a couple of reasons. One, when you take a baseball out of your hand, um, it's the 
perfect opportunity to improve your rotator cuff strength, to improve your scapular control, to improve your shoulder mobility, to, to work on stuff that's really, really hard to do while you're throwing. Um, cha- changing those things while someone's still throwing is like trying to change the tire on a car that's still moving. Right. It's just you're never going to be able to do it perfectly. So um, we really try to get them, you know, you take that first week or two um, maybe off. You know, a lot of guys, they usually take a week while they're moving back to their hometown or whatever it may be. And then we try to get them to work. The the big thing I would say is that we give them a break from a lot of aggressive rotation. Um, We give them a break from a lot of aggressive sprint work, um, anything like that. That first month back, you know, really mid October through mid November is really geared towards like, Hey, let's try to get our body weight back on track. Let's, you know, Let's optimize our sleep quality. Um, let's start building some strength back up. Let's work on mobility in the areas we need to. Um, let's build a little bit of foundation of work capacity. Um, build some single leg balance stuff along those lines. Um, you know, get manual therapy. Um, that's what we prioritize. But it's not about trying to like run fast, jump high, break med balls, things like that. Um, the other thing you're going to find, and, and I, I doubt this is true in your world, but it's definitely true in you know, I think other athletes, is there are some guys that are either all in or all out, right? So if they're working out, they're eating better, they're sleeping better, they're not boozing as hard. Mm-hmm. There are other guys that if they're not training, they will eat like crap. They will, you know, basically just go on an absolute like booze bender. So, you know, I just you you want to be aware of that psyche because if you can get them back in the gym, it's going to push out some of those other behaviors, um, you know, and, and, and make them a little bit more primed for success. So we don't dig the hole any deeper in those first couple weeks of the off season. Right. So these athletes they're they're getting back into the gym but mm-hmm. their sport is out on the field and i, I yeah. would imagine they're taking some time off from yeah. throwing and hitting and sprinting 100%. right yeah those guys aren't usually i mean there's some guys that will will do both year round um you know like they might continue to play catch lightly or you know swing twice a week off the tee or yep. with some soft toss but you know you're not going to see guys that are trying to like go out and play seven days a week but most guys i would say start ramping up around thanksgiving um is a safe bet in terms of throwing and hitting volume so they, they have kind of that seven or eight week block where they're not doing a ton of stuff in those regards um but then really what's like the first of the year rolls around is when they're going to really ramp up and you're probably going to see a lot more of those baseball activities and that's where a little bit of the gym volume is going to start to taper off how would your if you were coaching a high level crossfit athlete how would your what would your recommendation be for a for an off season and and keep in mind there there a ton a ton of repetitions of um high intensity weightlifting there's a lot of gymnastics involved yeah. what, what would your recommendation be you know, I, I don't know that it matters necessarily what sport we're talking about. It's like it, it comes back to principles, right? It comes back to, you know, what is it that you you struggle with, right? But from a pure movement competency standpoint, right? Is it that you have brutal shoulder flexion and you can't like get it back because you're doing so many pull-ups throughout the competitive right. calendar, you know? Is it that you're a little bit banged up in your hips and you need a break from squatting? Like you just have to kind of like come back to your evaluation and say, what, what do I identify as the biggest growth areas? What are the biggest problem areas? And how do I prioritize those in my training for the first month? And really like more than anything is you say, how do I, how do I find this period of lowered systemic stress, right? Um, is it that I reduce the frequency? Is it I reduce the intensity slash volume? What is the way that I give these guys a recharge so that they're, you know, they're, they're leaving the gym feeling more refreshed instead of like, you know, needing a forklift to get to the car. Right. I think that was the most skillful talk through a yawn I've ever heard. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you uh, killed it. That was not intention, man. I apologize. <laughs> oh man. It was almost inaudible. All right. I got a couple more questions for you and we'll wrap it up, man. Uh, in a world with so many distractions, you know, we've got social media, we've got the internet, there, there there's so many distractions for professionals these days. How do you stay focused on doing what you're doing with all, all of these distractions and opportunities going on? I'll, I'll be the first to say, I'm not good at it. Um, that's the first thing I would recognize is that, you know, it may seem that way from the outside, but I actually really struggle with it. But I, I think where I'm getting better, um, I meticulously, you know, manage my schedule. Like you just have to, 
you know, two businesses in two states plus my consulting business um, on top of my own training, on top of being a husband and a dad. You know, you, other people rely on me. Like I need to make sure that my staff has their schedule, that our nanny has their schedule, that, you know, my wife knows when I'm going to be home and, and all those things. So, um, you know, I really try to compartmentalize them. I know I train Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Um, I usually train Friday mornings and I train Saturday mornings or excuse me, Sunday mornings. So like, I know those are my four lifts each week. And then, you know, I fill in the cracks with some conditioning, um, you know, as needed. And that kind of cycles in and out over the course of the time. So, you know, I, I think it's the secret is to not find time. The secret is to make time mm -hmm. for what you have to do but um i'm like anybody else man like I, I i have distractions um i think the thing i've been really cognizant of too is I, you just have to learn to say no better and I, probably the best example i can give you like literally every exercise science professor on the planet gives their students like career paper assignments they say go interview a professional in you know a related field and you know ask them questions about what their day is like and you know what they struggle with and this that and the other so i i get two to three emails a day from kids at universities who ask if they can just hop on the phone for 30 minutes i was like no i mm -hmm. i physically if i gave all the time in the world to these folks like i would literally have no time for my kids and it would take away from the clients we have so um you know you, you have to say no and you feel like a total jerk doing it right because we all remember being that exercise science kid that just wanted to you know have some direction stuff like that. Right. Everybody just wants five minutes, you know, everybody just wants to pick your brain and stuff like that. Um, and they're really, really challenging. You know, it's, it's hard to say no to people when you know, they're good people, you know, that, you know, a big chunk of your professional success was that you, you were a giver and are a giver still, but you have to kind of like say, all right, well, you know, we're, we're doing this podcast. This is going to go out to, you know, tens of thousand people that follow you. Like if there's some tidbits in here that, you know, are going to be really impactful for some of them, that's awesome. If you were like a brand new podcast that had like four listeners and one was your mom and one was your grandma, right, like right. We're, we're not impacting people on a larger level. So I, I really try to try to gauge that in my, in my brain before I say yes or no to stuff. And, um, and then we plan accordingly. Love it, man. I've got a few rapid fires for you. Nice. Uh, you. They can be rapid answers or you can take as much time as you want. All right. What book have you given as a gift most often or recommended to others? Legacy by James Kerr. Um, that's my first one. We actually gave that to everyone in our college development uh, summer program last year. Um, awesome books just on leadership and organizational culture. Um, a, a close second would be Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. I've actually given that to several of our baseball players who have been drafted who are kind of deciding whether to go to, to college or sign a pro contract. Um, just a really good book, kind of like weighing decision-making options and understanding how the, the best answer usually isn't either or, it's it's and. Right, right. Love it. Yeah, those are both books I haven't heard of. They're on the list. Nice. There you go. What's a belief that you hold that if others held would have the biggest effect on their performance or and or life in general? The biggest belief I hold that could help others, huh? Um, I have a, a theory that if you teach your body to move efficiently, you will be rewarded with a body that just so happens to look good. Ooh, and, and that's so sexy. That's that's a challenging one. I've used that for years because I, I, I think the most overlooked component of long term success is continuity. Right. Like the, the people you see, like we have a, we have an intern actually in our Florida facility. It's an awesome story. Ken's 62 years old, the oldest intern I've ever taken. Um, and he's a guy who, who ran a, a, a business himself and has since retired. And he just wanted to stay mentally sharp in retirement and, and kind of have a little bit of a career change and challenge himself to learn new things. And he's been amazing. He's a uh, 62 years old. His last meet, he deadlifted 597 and squatted 570. Damn. Um, put together guy like looks the part and he's just power lifted years and years and years. And you, you look at the success he's had. He's never had that debilitating injury where he missed months and months and mm -hmm. months. You know what I mean? He's just been consistently under the bar and, um, finds ways to train around those little niggles and stuff. So I, I, I really feel strongly that if you teach your body how to move well, um, you're going to be rewarded with a body that's, that's going to look good for the long haul because you've, you've been consistent in the gym and, you know, and, and with your, you know, your, your nutrition and your recovery strategies and all that. That is, yeah, that is very, that's a very sexy uh, concept. And I think it applies to a lot of different areas of life, right? If it's not yeah. movement quality, then it's quality of work or quality of your relationships, right? If you, yeah. if you pay a little more atten attention to the technique, um, it, it, it all ends up going better. Quality over quantity, right? What is one action that you recommend people take immediately? 
Um, uh, show more great, be, be more grateful is what I would say. Um, cause I, I, I need to be better at that myself. And I, I feel like every time I, I go that extra step to write that thank you note or to make a phone call to someone who's done something nice for me or anything like that. Um, you know, it, it makes you feel good about yourself, but you know, you, you recognize that there are people out there that have really helped you. So, um, it's funny, actually our, our office manager ordered a, a stack of just blank Cressy sports performance cards. Um, and, and without fail, every time I, I write one of those to one of our clients or, you know, a former intern who's out there doing something or anything like that, it just, um, it's, it's like karma, you know, it's just, it's one of those things. So show, uh, write more thank you notes and say thank you more often. Yeah, that's, that's great advice as well, man. I, I my wife has a, a similar stack and it's been on my to-do list to order myself <laughs> one. And now you've inspired me. So I'm going to go do this immediately <laughs> after go. that. Yes. Um, I think that is it, man. You went easy on me. <laughs> yeah, this was great. Thank you so much. Where can no people, uh, where can people find you on social media? Uh, best bet is it's just at Eric Cressy on both Twitter, um, and, uh, Instagram. And then, uh, same thing for, uh, for a fan page. So on Facebook, um, then the website is just Eric Cressy.com. Awesome, brother. Uh, and those for those of you listening, Eric's got a ton of books, DVDs, courses all on his website. Uh, like I said, he is one of the guys that I really looked up to and continue to look up to in the world of strength conditioning. He's one of the best of all time. Check out all of his stuff. Um, there's also a ton of free articles online. The way that I found him uh, originally was through T Nation. Just some gold on that website. So go check them out. Eric, thanks again for your time, brother. That's what, Michael. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Take care. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW. 